Hello, my name is Mike Toot, and I'm going to be talking about the ligaments of the knee. The first two ligaments uh, to mention are the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. And cruciate is Latin for cross, and if you notice both on this sagittal proton density MR image that the ACL and PCL cross each other, and on a frontal view, the ACL and PCL cross each other as well. So the two cruciate paired ligaments. The other pair of ligaments are the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, and they're named for the side of the knee that they're on, obviously the medial collateral ligament over here, and the lateral collateral ligament which attaches to the head of the fibula. So starting with the ACL, it's called the anterior cruciate ligament uh, because it's positioned more anteriorly. Notice on the sagittal proton density image that the majority of the ligament is anterior to the PCL, and for its insertion onto the anterior portion of the tibia. On a proton density MR image, one of the most common images, uh, sequence, pulse sequences that we get in MR of the knee, it has normally an increased signal within it, mostly these striations, and that is due to two reasons. One is, it turns out there's two bundles of the ACL. You can kind of get that appearance here. If you look at T2-weighted MR images, that signal, those linear signal, uh, darkens a bit, but it's still intermediate signal. So here's a different patient, proton density-weighted sagittal MR image, and the T2-weighted, and you can still see a little bit of the striations in a normal anterior cruciate ligament. Well, the most common injury um, is that uh, to the curve to the ACL is a tear. And those are broken up really into two main categories, the complete tear, the one that's more devastating, the one you read about more because it requires surgery, and a partial tear. So here's a complete tear of the ACL, and here's another image showing a partial ACL tear. So starting with a complete ACL tear, there are three direct signs that you can see on MRI uh, when uh, making that diagnosis. Uh, the first the indication that somebody has a complete tear is if the entire ACL ACL is, disrupt, is disrupted with a fluid gap within it. The second one is where the entire ACL has a decreased slope or a wavy appearance. And then the third one is where there's diffuse or focal, just increased signal intensity within the ACL. So going through each of those, starting with the first, a disrupted ACL with a fluid gap. Notice here on this coronal image, you have fluid signal, and on this sagittal image, looking between the tibial attachment of the ACL heading up, it should have a taut appearance where it goes straight up to its attachment site up here. You've got this fluid gap right here indicating a complete ACL tear. The second sign is where the entire ACL is, uh, has decreased slope or a wavy appearance. Now notice that typically in order to look at the entire ACL, you want to look at the two consecutive images that go through the ACL. And notice that on this one, you've got this decreased slope of the ACL, and on this one, you have a wavy appearance on both of the images through the entire ACL. These are both complete ACL tears. And then the third sign is that diffuse or focal increased signal intensity. And this is fairly common. The problem with this is that this is also seen in partial ACL tears, as I'll show you in a minute. So here's a patient. Notice there was no fluid gap. They, you did not see the ACL fibers being wavy or laying flat, yet this turned out to be a complete ACL tear at surgery. There are a couple indirect signs that can help improve your accuracy for diagnosing a complete ACL tear. One of them is this pair of bone bruises in the weight-bearing portion of the medial, or sorry, the lateral femoral condyle and the posterior aspect of the uh, lateral tibia. And notice that in order for these kissing bone contusions to have occurred, the ACL had to have been torn, so allowing the tibia to sublux and have these two sites impact into each other. This is the classic pivot shift bone contusion pattern that's seen in complete ACL tears. The other thing is when the uh, patient is laying in the MRI scanner, if the tibia is, stays uh, anteriorly subluxed a bit because the ACL is torn, it can cause a buckled PCL. And the other one is called a double PCL sign where you have the uh, ACL laying flat and following a similar sort of arch as the PCL, uh, indicating that it's laying flat um, and uh, has a complete tear. 
There are a couple signs on x-ray. They're not very common. Uh, one of them is called a Sagan fracture, and that's where when the tibia subluxes, the lateral capsular ligament pulls off a small piece of bone. Uh, and that is starting to introduce, even though I'm going to talk about the four main ligaments of the knee, there are some smaller ligaments that can be important. And one of them is the small ligament that gives you this little fracture here off the lateral tibia at the insertion of this uh, lateral capsular ligament. Another one is just that somebody who has a bad bone contusion that actually fractures the subchondral bone plate, and this is called the deep sulcus sign, and that's a injury to the subchondral bone plate, a little impaction fracture that can occur after an ACL tear. All right, partial ACL tears implies that there are some intact fibers that are staying taut. Um, these can be somewhat tricky, and this has the appearance that sometimes overlaps with complete ACL tears, and sometimes we just have to say there's a high-grade tear of the ACL, possibly complete. This was an example of that. Here was an ACL uh, that looked a little wavy. Uh, on the adjacent images, which I'm not going to show here, you kind of got the sense that maybe this portion was one of the two bundles that actually was more intact. There was diffuse increased signal, not a fluid gap, so it didn't have one of the definitive signs. And this was this same patient nine months later, and notice that the ACL uh, is healed. Complete ACL tears do not heal, but partial tears, because there are some fibers that stay intact that act as a scaffolding, can heal, and that's what happened in this case. So this was presumably a partial ACL tear. All right, moving on to the posterior cruciate ligament, or the PCL couple key things about this. On MRI, on proton density images, it's normally dark signal. Notice how darker it is than a typical ACL. The other thing is that when the knee is extended in full extension at the time of the MRI, it's a little bit lax, unlike the ACL, which you can use that tautness of the fibers uh, to indicate if this is a tear. So normally it's a little lax like this and kind of has this sort of bowed appearance. PCL tears are less common than ACL tears. Uh, they can have the same pair of injuries or types of injuries, which is that you can have a partial tear like you see in this case where there was diffuse increased signal uh, within a partially torn PCL. And then you can have a complete tear where you have a fluid gap like you see here. Partial tears of the PCL typically heal, and so PCL um, reconstructions uh, for the injuries are actually much less common than ACL reconstructions. Uh, you can have a combined anterior and posterior cruciate ligament tears, and this is often given the name knee dislocation because of the degree of dis, uh, dislocation that has to occur to rupture both of these. The key thing is, uh, here is actually an example of somebody who's got an ACL tear and a PCL tear. Uh, the key thing about these is that you can have vascular and nerve injuries um, that occur when you have a dislocated knee, and so the orthopedic surgeons are going to check for pulses and check for if there's sensation uh, distal to the knee um, in these cases because they sometimes require additional surgeries besides just a reconstruction of those two ligaments if there's an injury to the vascular or the nerve. All right, moving on to the medial collateral ligament. This is also called the tibial collateral ligament because the distal insertion, unlike the one on the lateral side, occurs on the tibia. The MCL arises from the medial epicondyle right about here, and its insertion is about seven centimeters below the joint line, so way down at the bottom of this uh, image here. So a typical knee MR coronal image with a 14 centimeter field of view will often have the MCL uh, attachment site occurring right at the bottom of the, uh, of the image. This is the most commonly injured knee ligament, um, and it occurs due to a valgus injury where the tibia uh, is angled out laterally, causing stretch on the MCL. It's broken down into three main types because we include this sort of grade one sprain of the MCL, uh, and this is actually probably the single most common injury that occurs to the medial collateral ligament. The MCL can also have a grade two partial tear or a grade three complete tear, like you see here, similar to what we see with the anterior cruciate ligament. So what does this look like on MRI? A grade one sprain will have high signal adjacent to the medial collateral ligament. Here's the MCL, high signal adjacent to it. On a T1 weighted image, you have this gray 
uh, intermediate signal adjacent to the MCL, which turns out to be bright on the T2-weighted images. Notice that the MCL collagen fibers themselves look intact macroscopically because this is a sprained ligament and there is only microscopic injury to some of those collagen fibers. Grade 2 partial tear uh, implies that you see some intact fibers like you see here, but there's a tear of some of the fibers uh, like you see here. Two examples, a common place for a grade 2 partial tear is right at the uh, femoral origin of the MCL. Here's another example actually associated with a small avulsion fracture, but a few intact fibers uh, were present, and so this was a grade 2 partial tear with a small avulsion fracture. A complete tear, the best way to make that diagnosis accurately is to see wavy medial collateral ligament fibers. And they are wavy because when the patient is coming in for their MRI appointment, the gap will sort of form and the MCL will sort of settle a little bit with gravity and you'll get this wavy appearance. There's a pitfall uh, when looking at the MCL for uh, calling an injury, and that is that medial joint internal derangement, in other words, if somebody has a meniscal tear, or like in this case, bad osteoarthritis on the medial side of the knee, that can give you edema around the medial collateral ligament that mimics an MCL sprain. In this person's case, they did not have any acute injury to their knee, uh, and so this is all just reactive edema in the setting of somebody with medial compartment internal derangement. Another sort of pitfall when looking at the medial collateral ligament is being confused by the bone edema pattern. So here's a patient who's got on the MRI a lot of edema around the medial collateral ligament, and you think to yourself, is this a MCL sprain, grade one injury? Notice that the fibers look intact. And then you look at these bone contusions here, uh, and you, or should say bone edema, and you think, oh, is this the opposite? Is this a valgus force that actually caused it widening of the lateral side or injury to the lateral side of the knee with impaction on the medial side? But in fact, this edema is not a bone contusion. This is just bone marrow edema from the capsular ligament, which is deep to the MCL. There's a femoral, meniscal femoral one and a meniscal tibial capsular ligament, and these are actually edema under an avulsion injury. So this introduces another of these smaller ligaments that I'm not going to cover in much detail, which is attaching the meniscus to the femur and the meniscus to the tibia. And when these get uh, distraction injuries, they can cause edema within the underlying bone uh, or even tear like they probably did as well in this case, but the MCL itself only had a grade one sprain injury to it. So this was actually a valgus force with a typical stretch injury to the medial collateral ligament. All right, the lateral collateral ligament is also called the fibular collateral ligament because it inserts on the fibular head. It inserts actually with the biceps femoris tendon right adjacent to it. You can see how they're right adjacent to each other onto the uh, to the fibular head. Its origin is on the lateral femoral uh, epicondyle, and you can see it here in this uh, coronal proton density weighted image. The injuries that occur to the lateral collateral ligament are similar. You can have a grade one sprain like you see here where you have edema in the soft tissues on both sides of the lateral collateral ligament. You can see edema on both sides of it, but notice that the lateral collateral ligament fibers look pretty good and taut. There might be a little bit of increased signal within the lateral collateral ligament, but you don't see any frayed fibers that would indicate a macroscopic tear like seen with a grade 2 injury. Uh, we'll jump right to a lateral collateral ligament complete tear like you see here where you can't find any lateral collateral ligament because it's torn and probably balled up and retracted. This injury uh, can be a fairly significant injury, especially if it's associated with other injuries to the biceps femoris tendon um, or the popliteus, uh, biceps femoris tendon or the popliteus tendon. Um, when you have an injury to the fibular collateral ligament, it's often given this name posterolateral corner injury. And this is another site that can have some small ligaments uh, that can be torn. The uh, most concerning to the orthopedic surgeon is the popliteofibular ligament, a small ligament that is torn and often needs to be reconstructed or repaired uh, in the setting of a severe posterolateral corner injury.